Okay, so the last few people are coming in, so it's time to start our afternoon session, which is about observables and quantum gravity, and it is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker today. Um, oh, so there will be two long talks and one slightly shorter talk with brief time for questions, but afterwards there will be a long discussion session, so there's a lot of, there's enough chance for you to ask your questions. So I'm happy to introduce our first speaker, Philip Hoen from the Okinawa Institute for Science and Technology, and he's going to tell us about observables and dynamical frames in quantum gravity. Yeah, uh, thanks very much, and thanks to the organizers for having me here. Um, so yeah, I want to talk about how the concept of dynamical frames um, that has seen also a lot of attention in recent years in the context of quantum reference frames, uh, how that can help in the construction and interpretation of uh, observables in gravity, um, and in particular also how it can help to unify different approaches to gravitational observables. <coughs> So um, the talk will be mostly based on this paper already from last year. Um, some of you might have seen talks uh, by me about uh, that paper. For that reason, I'll try to focus on some aspects that I didn't speak about before. Um, right, so the, okay, yeah. So the, uh, the talk therefore starts with one of the very basic questions in, in, uh, in gravitational theories that um, all of us will have stumbled upon at some point. You know, the question of what are actually interesting observables in gravitational theories and how do you construct them in the face of diffeomorphism invariance. And there exist um, multiple approaches and they depend a little bit on the community that you come from and at least broadly speaking you can uh, separate at least a large class of them into two camps. Um, one is the kind of the so-called dressed observables uh, program that's more for the HEPTH uh, people and then uh, most of the not so happy age people um, often work with relational observables. But this uh, division doesn't stop uh, here. In fact, um, even the relational observables program has at least uh, three different classes. Um, there exist uh, covariant representations of them that also some of you, in fact, uh, actively work on, and we might hear about that also later this week. There exist so called single integral representations of relational observables. Um, again, uh, some of you actually work on that, and then there also exist uh, canonical power series representations of relation observables. And uh, with uh, so many approaches, one can, of course, ask um, what's the relation between them? Is there any one uh, approach that's actually somehow right or, or better, or, or, or maybe even more suitably, does there exist uh, kind of one approach that unifies them all and encompasses them all? And that's a little bit the aim of this talk, to, to give you such a unifying approach. It has to do with uh, the concept of dynamical reference frames. One uh, disclaimer I should make is, I'm, uh, although this is about observables in quantum gravity, I will actually exclusively speak about uh, classical gravitational theories. Um, but in any case, it's worthwhile to understand them a little bit better. And yeah, here, at least with these notions of observables, um, there's always some relational ideas. Uh, uh, involved, and um, the question is whether we can make the relation to, to dynamical frames more precise in the sense that we can understand them as being descriptions relative to dynamic reference frames. And then we can try and, and, and see whether we can also uh, connect it with the notion of dynamical frame covariance, where we can translate between different frame perspectives and maybe even formulate general covariance in, in the language of dynamical reference frames. Okay, um, if some of these uh, names here don't mean much to you, I will at least try to give you, a, 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 you know, some, some taste of, of what these approaches actually are in this talk. Okay, um, yeah, so gauge invariant observables, so just as a little bit of a, a setup here. Um, so uh, we are going to be interested in, in observables that are invariant under bulk diffeomorphisms, which are gauge. And so what we want to look at is kind of some objects O, um, defined on field space, so square brackets mean uh, it's a functional of, of some field configurations and this phi in the um, sense of the covariant phase space just labels field configurations, so configurations of all your dynamical fields, so it's not just the scalar field or something like this. And um, diffeomorphisms act by, um, by push forward and so we're going to look for observables that have that property. And a priori, so sometimes you hear that it's very difficult to find uh, gauge invariant observables in gravity, but in, at face value, it's not true because uh, um, we can always find some, any old covariant top form that has this property and then just integrate it over all of space time. And you'll find that this gives you some uh, gauge invariant observable. Uh, and you know, as an example, you can take alpha to be just basically the Ricci scalar and then you get the Einstein-Hilbert action, um, which in a strict sense is, is a gauge invariant observable. 
But of course, it's not a very informative one a priori. It doesn't tell you very much about local physics. And so the more interesting or relevant question is how do you actually construct phenomenologically relevant uh, uh, gauge and observables that have some you know, local information. And there's, of course, as many of you know, the, the tension between gauge invariance and locality, or at least in um, a traditional sense of locality in, in gravitational theories. And um, you can see that at the level of a scalar field. So scalar fields will be uh, denoted by var phi as opposed to this here, which is a field configuration. So diffeomorphisms act on that by, by, by um, push forward. So in this way, so that already tells you that the value of the scalar field at some space time event x can be gauge invariant only if either um, it's a constant, that field in space time, or if, if x is a boundary point where um, gauge diffeomorphisms might act trivially. Now, um, clearly, we want to have more interesting uh, uh, local observables. And so a priori, okay, there's a tension with the traditional notion of, of, um, of locality in terms of fixed labelings of events. And the question is, how do we go about this? And uh, well, we're clearly not going to give up gauge invariance, so we have to somehow adjust our notion of locality. And this notion of locality that kind of fails here is one on, based on fixed, so that is non-dynamical non reference frames. And so that brings us to the notion of dynamical reference frames. So this is a quote of Einstein that I'm sure many of you have seen before, um, but it kind of fits here, so let me just uh, quote it. And that's uh, the statement that the theory, so general relativity, introduces two kinds of physical things, measuring rods and clocks, so basically the reference frames, and then all other things like fields and so on. And this, in a certain sense, is inconsistent. Strictly speaking, measuring rods and clocks would have to be represented as solutions of the basic equations. And so that's kind of uh, what we're trying to head at, a realization of, of this, or a resolution of this. To get a bit of inspiration, let's uh, quickly look at, at special relativity with internal frames, so tetrads. Really, what are they? Um, you can, I mean, these are maps, at least if I apply them to vectors, so a kind of a map from Minkowski space to some other space. Um, and uh, well, they're actually group valued in the, in the Lorentz group um, because of uh, normalization conditions. And here you can act on, on, on these frames by gauge transformations, which would be just basically um, space-time uh, um, uh, Lorentz transformations. And then you can use these, uh, these, these tetrad vectors to contract whatever other vector you might be interested in to turn it into something that's invariant under space-time. Uh, uh, um, Lorentz transformations. Now, in gravity, we're going to do something very similar, but here we're going to look at something dynamical, and uh, these will be maps um, that will take us from space time to some other space, we can call frame orientation space, and uh, they can also be, uh, they need not be, but they can be group valued if it happens that this map is something like a diffeomorphism, and so they will be depend on the field configuration, and so in particular on the solution in the end, and so in that sense they will defined as something like a dynamical coordinate system. And similarly to these gauge transformations here for, um, in quotation marks for, for, uh, for tetrads, what we want to look at is, is frames that, that transform kind of nicely or gauge covariantly under, under gauge transformations. And so we require that they have this property here. Now, when you put um, coordinates on O, this is just tantamount to meaning, so they transform basically as scalars. So when you put coordinates on, on the space O, um, that, then what they give rise to is nothing else than um, some dynamical space-time scalars um, that are somehow constructed out of the field content of your theory. Okay. Um, now the question is how do you actually re realize that? And, and let me discuss this now in the context of dressed observables, so this kind of HEPTH program. Um, and here the aim is typically that you know, we're given some naked or bare quantity that's not invariant by itself. And somehow we want to dress it uh, with some other degrees of freedom into some composite operator that is gauge invariant. And um, for scalar fields, so let me um, uh, yeah, just uh, illustrate this on, on scalar fields. Um, this means in practice nothing else than finding a dynamical specification of space-time events. Uh, so they depend now on the field configuration in such a way that under gauge transformations, they, um, this transforms like so. Um, now, uh, why do you want to have this? This basically means that if you evaluate a scalar field at such a dynamically defined event, it will be gauge invariant. Uh, 
Um, and just to give you a bit of an intuition, so in particular in the HAPTH community, so a lot of people like boundaries, so they like to use the boundary as a reference, and so often the stressing means kind of anchoring your description relative to boundary. A very simple example of that is um, you have some boundary here and you shoot in a geodesic into space-time uh, from some anchor point Z into some direction here and then uh, uh, a certain distance into space-time. Um, so you define dynamically a space-time event like this in terms of such a parameterization. And you can convince yourself that this actually satisfies this, this condition. Um, and because it transforms in this way, when I evaluate the scalar field, at the endpoint of the geodesic, um, uh, basically under transformations, these Fs just cancel and it's going to be gauge invariant. So and that represents the value of the scalar field at the end of the geodesic. So that's kind of uh, standard in, 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 in the stressed observables program. Now the question is, can we actually relate that to dynamical frames? And so that's kind of the additional step that, that we put on this. It's not a, not a huge development, but it turns out to be quite useful. And in this case, um, you could just, instead of just looking at a single uh, geodesic, you can just look at a whole congruence of geodesics shooting into the bulk. And then, um, uh, and then you can use basically these parameters um, uh, as, as, yeah, as parameters um, yeah, to parameterize bulk uh, uh, space-time points dynamically. Um, and then this map from this space here of parameters into space-time defined by really just this map here um, then defined to something that transforms gauge covariantly in, the, in, this, in this sense here. Um, now the thing is, of course, we would like to have a dynamical frame field, so a map from space-time into uh, you know, this parameter space. So what we can do is, um, uh, this set of parameters is in general, of course, going to be over-complete. Um, so if I'm in four dimensions, then tau and z will be four parameters. Uh, w also, there will be three parameters, so that will be sort of seven coordinates uh, for four-dimensional space-time, so that's too much. Um, but what we can do is uh, restrict to some subset of that parameter space uh, on which um, this map turns out to be injective. So for example, you can achieve it by just fixing the boundary vector field, so fixing once and for all the directions at which we shoot the geodesics in. And then uh, that defines you, okay, an injective map into some field-dependent sub-neighborhood in space-time on which we can invert it. And because of this transformation property here, um, this, this guy will just transform as a scalar. And if I put suitable coordinates on this space, then you can go and convince yourself that that sets up um, dynamical uh, scalar fields um, that are actually constructed out of the metric, um, uh, just because you know, I'm just using geodesics. And these scalar fields basically assign to each space-time point you know, the values, um, whatever, tau and z uh, that I use to parameterize the bug points. And when I do something like this, I can then also rewrite the stressed observable in this fashion here, just basically by pulling back um, the scalar field um, to the space OI or O1. And then I can precisely interpret that observable now as a relational observable. What's the value of phi um, you know, at the event in space time where the frame is in the local orientation tau z. Okay? So in this way, we can see already that uh, we can interpret these stressed observables as a uh, in fact, in a, in a relational sense, as a relation observable. Now, having this, this map here is actually also very useful if you want to address anything else than scalars. Um, for a scalar, it's sufficient to have just, uh, you know, it's an ultra-local object, so just having a parameterization of a single space-time point is sufficient. But if I want to look at something like vectors or so, then, then I will, in any case, need something like this here. So this will then also allow us to construct, for instance, dressings of tensor fields and so on. Okay, now let's, let's move on to covariant relation observables, and basically they work now in, in essence the same way. Now the aim is here that we have some uh, non-invariant quantity and we want to localize it relative to some reference scalar field degrees of freedom that we build out of our field content. Um, and so effectively what we are indeed looking for is some gauge covariant frame that transforms like this. Um, and typically, uh, with, with relational observables in, in literature, people consider these frames to be built locally out of the matter fields. And, um, but then, basically, the idea is the same as before now. We can just uh, take some covariant uh, functional, some tensor field, say, on, and then we can just frame dress it in this, in this way, and then it just becomes gauge invariant just because of these transformation properties where the Fs, the, the diffeomorphisms, will just, the actions will just cancel. 
Now it's important to note that um, this object here is now, because I'm pulling it back to the orientation space, it's actually a, a, you know, some observable or some object that lives on this, this orientation space. So here's space time, maybe the neighborhood where the, the frame is valid, and here's some observable here that I pull back to, um, to this orientation space. And then here in this orientation space, there's no more gauge symmetry. So I have a locally deparametrized theory. You can uh, interpret this here really as, uh, you know, as a relation observable that is uh, kind of constituting or answering the question, what's the value of you know, certain uh, components if it's a tensor of, of A at the event and space time where the frame field is in a certain uh, local orientation. Okay, now it should be fairly clear then uh, from what I'm telling you here already that uh, dressed observables and covariant relation observables are basically the same thing. Um, in particular, if I allow um, the frame fields um, to be general, um, so meaning they can be built out of matter or geometric degrees of freedom, they can be locally constructed, non-locally constructed, if I allow all of that, then they're exactly the same. And that's, um, you know, typically in, in, in HAPTH, it's boundary anchored, so you use kind of known local constructions of, of frames, and conversely, for instance, in more canonical uh, the minded people, they like uh, compact, uh, spatially compact type of surfaces where you can't do, uh, where it's, you know, you kind of use more locally uh, defined frames. Um, but if you suitably extend the notion of what the dynamic reference frame is allowed to be, then the two notions of dressed and, and covariant relational observers are exactly the same. Five minutes. Yeah. Um, now let's go to this other representation, um, the so called single integral relational observables. The aim is basically the same. It's also a covariant representation. Let me just give you an, a toy example. Suppose we have four scalar reference fields that happen to parametrize space-time. Then here one uses uh, an integral to basically answer the question, what's the value of phi at the event in space-time where the reference field takes certain values? Um, you know, and, and in particular, this, this form under the integral is indeed a covariant top form, so it's a gauge invariant. Uh, uh, observable. Um, what's the relation to the covariant representation? It's pretty obvious. Um, in this case, we just set these fields we identified with the frame, basically put that into the, uh, plug that in, and then we just uh, solve that, um, oops, the, uh, the delta function, and then we see, okay, it's just, you know, exactly the same observable that we had before for this case of a, of a scalar field and frames, uh, frame fields that are globally defined. Now, you can generalize that also to frames that are globally defined. Um, if you introduce certain characteristic functions um, that vanish outside the neighborhood where the frame is well defined. And you can also generalize this to smearings um, of, of relational observables where, for instance, also you don't peak it with a delta function, but you can smear it in other ways. And that basically amounts to just smearing um, relational observables in, in your local orientation space. And you can also generalize it to, to other tensor fields. Okay, so again, um, if you uh, allow for these, these generalizations of these single integral representations, then you just get also exactly that they're equivalent to, to the covariant uh, observables. Now, uh, maybe as a last uh, topic, um, let's go to the uh, canonical formulation of relational observables. And this is now a lot more tricky, the relation uh, to the covariant uh, formulations. So here, um, the idea is to use, uh, in the canonical, basically in the ADM phase space, to use some reference scalar fields to localize um, well, other dynamical degrees of freedom. Um, and so this hinges really on the relation between the covariant phase space and the canonical phase space. And that's a non-completely obvious relation. It was discussed uh, by Lee and Wald uh, in a nice paper. Um, basically, the covariant phase space it's defined by the field space of covariant field configurations. Um, it has a subspace of solutions that, that we care about. And the kinematical phase space is basically obtained in the following way. In the covariant phase space, you priori don't need to choose any Cauchy slice. But when you want to link it with the, um, with the ADM formulation, you have to choose a Cauchy slice. When you do that, you can obtain a pre-symplectic form defined on, on this field space here. Because it's pre-symplectic, it has degenerate directions. I can mod out those de degenerate directions that defines uh, kind of something like a, a quotient map. 
And the image of that quotient map is a space that has a well-defined symplectic form. That's a phase space. That's the um, ADM phase space. And if you apply that map to the space of solutions, then uh, the image of the space of solutions is just the standard constraint surface in, in, in the ADM phase space. And OK, um, it just so happens if you have some covariant relation observable, by construction, it will restrict to one on the canonical uh, constraint surface, and that's because it's invariant under all the along the gauge orbits, and the gauge orbits they are at least uh, mapped partially in some sense to gauge orbits here. Um, not um, there's some gauge orbit information that's actually not uh, that doesn't descend down. Um, those are diffeomorphisms that don't leave the space-like nature of the hypersurfaces invariant. So in some sense, it. Con uh, constitutes a partial gauge fixing, but so in some sense you can view that as a, as a partial gauge fixing. But in that direction, it will always uh, work in such a way that the, um, you know, that the covariant observables map to, to canonical observables. Okay, and uh, under certain restrictions, you can show that, uh, uh, that, these, um, that this object here, this canonical observable, can be written in a power series form um, that's only valid on the constraint surface uh, with uh, constraints as generators, and these are smear constraints that basic, basically correspond to the smeared um, ADM Hamiltonians. And that's, in a nutshell, kind of the stuff that uh, Bianca Dietrich proposed, um, well, nearly 20 years ago, so, which you can recover. So under certain restrictions, you also get that the covariant and power series are, are equivalent. So I think I'm running out of time. So um, uh, this was just to mention that you can also get Generalizations of the notion of frames, it doesn't only have to apply to events in space-time, it can also apply to extended objects such as submanifolds. and in this way you can also, for instance, understand minimal surfaces or areas on minimal surfaces such as an holography as relation observables relative to an extended notion of, of, of dynamical frame. But uh, maybe let me not go into this and I think I skipped the part on frame changes as I guess time is up. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and then I also skipped the part on, on general covariance, maybe. So yeah, here's the summary. So we basically have now one approach that kind of encompasses basically all of these approaches to gravitational observables, really unifies them, and that's based also on using dynamical reference frames. Um, when each of them is suitably extended, they're all equivalent, and then up to some fine print for the canonical approach. Um, and OK, I guess the other parts here didn't actually even have time to discuss, so let me just leave it here. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Philip, for this great overview talk and the relation between these different formalisms. We have time for one or two quick questions. Yeah, Param. <laughs> so in, in, in the previous, uh, when you did the covariant single integral, etc., you never made any restriction to solutions, right, to the field equations. But when you yeah, so so is there some different? I mean, I'm, so something okay. off shell, something on shell, something. Uh, yeah, I mean, at the end of the it's day, it's a big question. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, you also only care about the restriction to the space of solutions. So. I mean, classically, at least, that's of course the only thing that matters. So I didn't mention it, but yeah, in the end, you would also restrict at that level. Sometimes in the explicit constructions, it's maybe not so explicitly mentioned, but effectively at the end of the day, because you want to solve equations of motion, you, you always go to the restriction. Yeah. We have time for one more question. Steffen. Yeah, thanks for the nice talk. Um, I was just wondering, so these kind of equivalent statements, whether they depend on the type of matter fields that you're using, for example, brown kukash dust and things like this, which are designed to give you reference frames. Does that improve somehow these uh, statements? Does it improve what statements? The so you said, for example, for the yeah. equivalence for the covariant and canonical power series representations, that ah, there was some fine okay. print and certain conditions needed to. Yeah, so the, okay, <laughs> uh, the fine print is a little bit uh, hard to explain in, 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 in few words, but it has to do indeed with the types of frames you can, um, you can look at. Then in the, in the frame dressing, there's these 
you know, maps to the orientation space involved. Um, there's restrictions on, on those maps for which it works. Um, what those restrictions mean concretely in the case of uh, the brown Kukash dust, off the top of my head, I, I don't know. But, um, but it could be that in that case it actually, because it's a very simple reference frame that can, well, actually in that case it's even, it defines you diffeomorphism, the scalar field, so in that case I think the restrictions um, would be, I mean, it would satisfy the conditions for, for mapping this. Yeah. And for instance, parameterized field theory does too, for sure. But, uh, so, Carlos, you had a question. Is it brief? Um, yeah, I think it's pretty elementary. You can. Okay, let me do it in the discussion session. 